All right, so let's take a look at a few terms from the beginning of chapter one. This is in uh, in one one actually. Um, data. Now I'm I'm not going to give you a um, a vocabulary test, or I don't plan on it. But it's important that you understand what these terms mean, because we may uh, work problems that refer back to these terms. Okay, uh, data pretty easy to understand, just collections of observations. There's lots of ways to observe things. The collection of those observations, that would be data. <coughs> All right. And your, your textbook says, such as measurements, genders, survey responses. Um, but that's just examples. But these collections of observations, that is data. Or some people call it data. Statistic. What is statistics? Statistics is the science of planning, studies, and experiments, obtaining data, and then organizing, summarizing, presenting, analyzing, interpreting, and drawing conclusions based on the data. And each one of these characteristics is very important. I mean, imagine if you had a set of data, but it wasn't organized. If you can't organize a set of data, then how can you effectively even understand the data? Um, you know, we need to know how to analyze the data. We need to know how to interpret what we have. So, I mean, every one of these characteristics of, of statistics is very important. Um, whenever we collect data, Sometimes data is collected from a population. Sometimes it's collected from a uh, sample. So there is a difference. Uh, population is going to be the complete collection of all individuals to be studied. So let's say that my study was on um, U.S. Senators. Then the population would be the collection of all of the U.S. Senators. Or let's say that my study was on um, my statistics class. Well, it would be the complete collection of everyone in my statistics class. That would be the population. Okay. Now, if we take the collection of data from every member of a population. That's called a census. <clears throat> I'm sure that some of you in here can remember the census of 2010. If not, um, probably the census of 2020 will be one whenever you would, you know, you'd have, if you don't have your own home right now, you'll probably have it by then. You'll probably have your degree you have your home, uh, but it's usually uh, the U.S. Census is given every 10 years. Uh, I can remember 2000. I really don't remember 2010 for some reason. I don't know, maybe my wife did it. Um, but usually someone comes around either to your house to get information or they send you a packet. Uh, it is a big deal. So a census is the collection of data from every member of the population. All right. So whenever we we get data, or we collect data, usually we either collect the data from the population or we take a sample. All right, a sample is a subcollection of members selected from a population.
So for example, if I was doing a study on this class and I took a sample of this class, maybe I just chose Miss Ray, Mr. Funk, Miss Smith, then that would be a sample from the population of this entire class. So it is a subcollection, like a small subset of the entire set. Okay. Um, you need to make sure that uh, when collecting data, or if you have sample data, that it is collected in an appropriate way, such as through a process of random selection. Everyone in here understands what random means, right? So it's important that if I wanted to collect data on a topic, maybe that topic is more interesting, say, for males and females, generally. And if I selected all of my samples and they all had males always, then that would not be very representative of this class. So it's important that when you do collect data, that you do get the data in some type of random way. If sample data are not collected in an appropriate way, the data may be so completely useless that no amount of statistical torturing can salvage them. Salvage them. So it's important to, to not just have a bunch of numbers that, uh, that may not have much meaning behind them. Uh, there are a lot of examples of uh, collecting data in 1-2. Um, one two discusses uh, that whenever you do uh, gather data or, or, or conduct some type of statistical analysis that you remember the context of the data, the source of the data, and of course how are you going to get the data? What's the sampling method? Um, again, I don't want to read just all this word for word. I expect you to to look in your textbook from time to time and, and read the sections. Um, and you don't have to read them all word for word, but at least read through the bolded terms, read through the examples. It doesn't take very long to do that. Again, this isn't a typical math class where you're just going to be looking at formulas and crunching numbers. You know, you're not going to be doing any factoring in here. Um, this is more of an applied math class, so it's important that, that you do read the example so you can uh, understand the different terms and concepts. Um, your book gives, uh, as an example of uh, the context of the data, your book talks about a table that's given in your book and it says the data is taken from data set 3 in appendix B, that means it's in the back of the book. Uh, it says the entries in the table are weights in kilograms of Rutgers students. The X values are weights measured in September of their freshman year, and the Y values are the corresponding weights measured in April of the following semester. All right, so these weights are included in a study described changes in the body weight and fat mass of men and women in the first year of college, a study of the freshman 15. All right, or in my case, the freshman 50. No, not really, but uh, the title of this article, it says, tells us the goal of the study. Determine whether college students actually gain 15 pounds during their freshman 15, as it is commonly believed according to the freshman 15 legend. All right, so uh, it's very important that you understand where the data comes from. If you were just to look at, at the table provided, See if, if, uh, if I can find some. Um, if you were just to look at this table here, don't worry about this title, and it, and it just had X and Y and numbers up here, it wouldn't mean much. Um, it's important that when presenting data, that you do label your data. You do, uh, you know, if you're going to sort the data somehow, then make sure that it is sorted in a way and labeled in a way that everyone can understand your data. So it's, uh, it's important that, that you do uh, consider the context of the data. 
the source of the data? Well, that's very important. If you were reading a study that said chocolate actually helps you lose weight, this study was conducted by Hershey. Yeah, what's the source of the data? Um, you know, if it's a study done by, you know, some type of uh, organization that maybe uh, is concerned with weight loss, yeah, I might believe it. But if, if Hershey is conducting a study trying to tell me that chocolate is going to help me lose weight, then I might be a little skeptical. It's important that you do understand the source. The sampling method. How is data collected? Um, what if the data I was talking about earlier about the freshman 15, what if it was just taken from, it was just taken from freshmen who were majoring in nutrition? More than likely, if you're majoring in nutrition or something along that lines, then that's something you're very interested in. That's something that you apply to your life. So more than likely, those people will not gain weight. Um, on the other hand, if it was somebody who was majoring in, I don't know, something that uh, maybe they're majoring in, uh, well, I don't want to say, I don't know, culinary arts or uh, maybe something where they're going to be around a lot of food. They may be tempted during that freshman year to eat more. Uh, but anyway, with all that said, the sampling method is very important. Um, even the, the way that you sample, like, make sure that if you do some kind of study or you, somebody asks you about a study, that you always do it uh, randomly. Keep it as random as possible. <clears throat> Voluntary response sample. So this is one where the respondents decide whether to be included. Be careful if the topic that, that maybe you're interested in, if you ever do a study, uh, believe it or not, if you decide to go into the medical field, uh, maybe some type of nursing, and you're getting your master's, you don't know how many master's students that I've helped with their statistics. <clears throat> and those students um, usually have to pick a topic that relates, of course, to, to your health. But... <clears throat> Be careful when conducting a study if you're conducting one on something that is um, a little controversial because especially, you know, if you have a voluntary response sample with that because the only responses you're going to get are the people who feel strongly about that topic. Here, here are some uh, common examples of voluntary response samples. Internet polls, mail-in polls, telephone, <clears throat> call-in polls. Internet polls, they will survey you to death on the Internet. It seems like I can't go to any website now without a little pop-up coming up saying, would you mind taking a survey before you leave or something like that. It's, uh, they're really interested in your information. Everybody wants your information. I always wear your tinfoil hat so they can't get your information. All right. Uh, your book gives some good examples of voluntary response samples. Um, good to read through these just to kind of, you know, see real world examples of this stuff uh, going on. Analyze. Uh, your book says after carefully considering context, source of data, and sampling method, we can proceed with an analysis that should begin with appropriate graphs and exploration of the data. Graphs are discussed in Chapter 2 and important statistics are discussed in chapter three. So, um, you know, make sure that you use some type of way to, to show your data that is understood by most people. Don't try to get too fancy. There are some ways to categorize data that, that confuses everybody, or almost everybody. I'll eventually show you some, some of those uh, ways to summarize data. Uh, but things like pie charts and bar graphs, those usually go over really well. Make sure that, uh, that if you use something like that, that you don't mislead people by adjusting scales and things like that, like there was at the beginning of the chapter. Um, we had this graph here at the beginning of the chapter. And this survey, make, using this graph, makes it look like 
there's just so much more. There's a billion times or a million times more people said yes. Not really that many, but you get what I'm saying, and it's really not that big of a difference. Uh, the no's was over 60,000, and the yeses was, you know, over 100,000. So it's around those numbers. That's not that big of a difference, but looking at this graph here, it does look like that big of a difference. So. Alright. Conclude. So statistical significance is achieved in a study when we get a result that is very unlikely to occur by chance. A lot of problems that we work in here are related to um, the birth of children, whether it be male or female. Or, you know, if you have three children, then how many would be male or female? Um, here's an example of something that is uh, really not going to happen by chance. Getting 98 girls in 100 random births. It says that is statistically significant because such an extreme event is not likely to be the result of random chance. Uh, or getting 52 girls in 100 births, that's not statistically significant because that event could easily occur with random chance. So what if we were looking at a study uh, where some uh, geneticist said that they had successfully figured out a way that you could pick the gender of your child. And we looked at 100 births, and out of those 100 births, 98 of them were girls, and that's what everyone wanted. All 100, because you know girls are so much better than boys, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be pretty successful. Now, that's that's not very technical. That's not a very te technical statistical analysis, but uh, that does have a s statistical significance because it's so many out of the hundred. Uh, so that would be something that we could look at a little further. Um, but don't come to a conclusion easily. Be very skeptical when looking at data and statistics. Practical significance. That's uh, what we were talking about. And there's a couple of examples here uh, in the book <coughs> that you can read through on practical significance. Misleading conclusions, just like I was telling you that, that uh, bar graph, that was very misleading. And here's a couple of examples about phony data. Um, reported results. It says when collecting data from people it is better to make measurements yourself instead of asking subjects to report results. Ask people what they weigh and you are likely to get their desired weights. <coughs> not their actual weights. Accurate weights are collected by using a scale to measure weights, not by asking people to report their weights. So can we go around the class and I'll ask everybody how much they weigh? No, that's, that's a touchy topic. Nobody wants to talk about that, right? Guys a lot of times really don't care, but it seems like uh, women uh, do care about that, that topic. Now, I'm not saying all guys don't care. I probably wouldn't tell you my real weight if you ask. Um, but yeah. Small samples. Conclusions should not be based on samples that are far too small. The Children's Defense, Defense Fund published Children Out of School in America, in which it reported that among secondary school students suspended in one region, 67% were suspended at least three times. But that figure is based on a sample of only three students. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. If I wanted to know, do you like cheese pizza? And I chose two students out of here, and I asked that, and you know, and I took those results and I used those. That would not be very representative of the entire class. Maybe that person doesn't even like pizza, or one of those two doesn't like pizza. Um, but yeah, so it's important that sample sizes are not too small. Loaded questions. You can word questions in a way to elicit the right resp or the responses that you want. Not the right responses, but the, the responses that you want. There's an example in your book of a survey that was given or questions that were asked, and just because they asked the question in the way that they did, it basically meant the same thing, but they got the, the answer they wanted, or maybe not wanted, but they got, they got everybody to give almost the same answer. Let's look at that. It says, should the president have the line item veto to eliminate waste? Of course, nobody likes waste, except for the wasteful people, right? So everyone says yes, but this says, should the president have the line item veto or not? really doesn't give an example that hits home. So for that, only 97% of all people said yes. 
or, or 57 percent said yes for the one that should he have the line item veto to eliminate waste was 97 percent so by putting things in questions you can get people to answer in a certain way so be careful about that statistics is sexy right yeah of course it is all right missing data uh, missing data of course would be important um, if let's say that I took a collection of what you what every student made on the first test in here but on the same day of that test Phi Theta Kappa the two-year honor society had a convention and all the students that in this class that are in Phi Theta Kappa were gone so that would just leave us with the people not in Phi Theta Kappa um, not saying that they would do worse but I would be willing to bet that overall if I took the class average on students that weren't in an honor society I would think that it would probably be a little small a little lower than the students that are in that honor society so it wouldn't really be fair for me to base a study off of uh, maybe maybe let's say that the test average was a 70 so I'm like man I must have been a horrible job teaching this stuff but that same day 10 students were out that usually made close to 100 on the test. It wouldn't be a very good study or a very good uh, experiment for me to make. So it's important that all data is, is present. Precise numbers. This is kind of funny. Section 101 included a statement that there are 241,472,385 adults in the United States. That's just way too precise. Uh, be skeptical if you hear precise numbers. Um, not saying that it's incorrect, but a lot of times um, people just assume that that's accurate. I'm sure that's not accurate. Well, I say sure, but uh, you'd want to use something like maybe maybe like 240 million or something like that if you were writing about a number of people. Percentages. Give 110%. How can you give 110%? You can't. If you give 100%, that's everything. There's nothing else there. Um, keep that in mind. Understand percentages. How do we convert from percentages to decimals? I remember. So like we have 75%. That's equal to 0.75. You move the decimal place two places to the left. Okay? If you go from a percentage to a decimal. To go from a decimal to a percentage, you move the decimal place two places to the right and add a percentage sign. If there's not a place, you add a zero. So that 0.1 is the same as 10%. All right? If you want to get a percentage of a number, like 25% of 100 then you convert to a decimal so that would be 0 0.25 of means multiply so 0 0.25 times 100 and what's 0 0.25 times 100 25 just so happens that it's the same number as a percentage because I use 100 So you might want to look through a couple of these problems out of the back. Uh, there's nothing too terribly complicated from 1.2. It's uh, a 1.1 or 1.2. It's pretty straightforward, and it's a lot of reading and terms and, and understanding those terms. <laughs>